Okay, so we have a few more people coming in, but um, I did want to welcome you. Uh, my name is Rebecca Mergenthal, and I'm chair of the history department. And on behalf of the department, I would like to thank you very much for coming out tonight. We haven't been able to have this lecture in a while, and it's wonderful, wonderful to have you in the room. I also would like to thank all of you who um, are on the live stream. This is being live streamed, so I uh, would like to welcome them as well. Uh, for those of you coming in late, there's seats towards the front <laughs> because everybody filled in in the back. Um, we would like to start with the land acknowledgement. Uh, PLU is on the traditional lands of the Nisqually, Puyallup, Squaxin Island, and Steelcomb peoples. We acknowledge and respect the traditional caretakers of this land. And I would also like to acknowledge that land acknowledgements are, need to be linked to action to make them fully effective. We are gathered here tonight for the Walter C. Schnackenberg Memorial Lecture. Dr. Schnackenberg graduated from PLU, Pacific Lutheran College at the time, in 1937, and was a long time and much beloved uh, professor of history here. Uh, Dr. Schnackenberg was committed to liberal arts education, and he was a fierce supporter of faculty governance. His publications include the book, The Lamp and the Cross, Sagas of Pacific Lutheran University from 1890 to 18, 1965, which was published uh, for the uh, 75th anniversary of PLU. Um, I recently read this book, which was very engaging, and I thought the students here today would like to hear a little example about how things have changed since the early days. So in the early days of PLU, if a student wanted to go leave PLU campus and go up to Tacoma, they had to get permission to do that. And the permission had to come from the president of the university. So, Think how much easier your life is now. <laughs> That's the lesson. <laughs> the Schnackenberg family endowed this lectureship uh, to honor Dr. Schnackenberg, and we are very grateful for their support. Uh, this lecture continues to be an important part of our department and PLU community more broadly. The Schnackenberg family members are not able to be here tonight in person, uh, but they are watching over the live stream, so if you could thank, join me in thanking them with a round of applause for their support for this lecture. And I would also like to uh, sort of announce to you, if you don't know, or um, tell you that uh, the Schnackenberg Lecture this year is uh, the launching point for PLU's Earth and Diversity Week. Um, so there are many great events this week that you can take part in. Uh, you may have gotten a punch card if you're a student, so this you can get this, <laughs> recognize that you're here, attend two more events, and you get a coffee card. So in addition to learning things, you'll have a reward. So um, I do want to say that it's been a real pleasure to coordinate uh, this talk and our topic here with um, others on campus, Nicole Giuliano, Mike Behrens, um, in terms of coordinating these to think about themes of learning and, and sort of moving these qu questions forward at the university. Um, I think it's a real opportunity for us to link to things like the STEAM Symposium, Family Symposium that will be Monday, and other kinds of earth and diversity things happening on campus. So that's been a great opportunity for us. Um, so this year's uh, Schnackenberg Lecture, we're very pleased to have Dr. Joshua Reed. Dr. Joshua Reed was born and raised in Washington State and is an enrolled member of the Snohomish Indian Nation. Uh, Dr. Reed received his BA from Yale University and his PhD from the University of California, Davis. Uh, currently, he is an Associate Professor of American Indian Studies and has an endowed Associate Professorship of History at the University of Washington. He also directs the uh, UW Center for the Study of the Pacific Northwest. Dr. Reed's first book was entitled, uh, The Sea is My Country, The Maritime World of the Macaws. Uh, it's a book that won multiple awards and there are copies for sale in the lobby, which Dr. Reed would be happy to sign for you. <laughs> so um, in this book, Dr. Reed tells the story of the Macaws, uh, an indigenous people of the Northwest Coast from the 18th century to the present. Uh, this book is a model of ethno-historical research. He draws an impressive array of sources, archival collections, oral interviews, legal records, and more. Um, in addition to uh, thinking about the kinds of sources he used, one thing that's really noteworthy about this book is the kind of story it tells. Works on Native American history have often emphasized land-based sovereignty, and Dr. Reed uh, introduces the reader to maritime Pacific space from which power came through the sea. 
So adding, really expanding how we think about Native American uh, history. In addition, throughout the book, Dr. Reed foregrounds macabre voices and their perspectives and experiences while offering a new way to think about colonialism, borderlands, and environmental history. So in his talk tonight, which is entitled Macaw Voices in the Sea, Dr. Reed will share some of his research with us. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Joshua Reed. Great, thank you all for taking the time to be here this evening. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Rebecca Mergenthal for the invitation uh, to speak with you today, and of course, uh, for the Schnackenberg family for their generous support of this annual lecture. On the morning of May 17, 1999, eight macaw men paddled the hummingbird up to the three-year-old gray whale. Ignoring the drizzling rain, buzz of news copters above, and the watchful eyes of a federal biologist, Theron Parker thrust the harpoon into the 30-ton Leviathan. From a nearby support craft, a modified 577 caliber rifle roared three times. The third shot lanced through the water and into the whale's brain, killing it within seconds. As the female whale died off Washington State's Pacific coast, Harpooner Theron led the crew in prayer, thanking her for offering herself to the macaws. Surrounded by a small fleet of canoes from neighboring American Indian nations, the hummingbird brought the whale ashore at Nia Bay about 12 hours later. Hundreds of men pulled on two heavy chains, hauling her onto the beach where generations of whalers had beached them before. Theron sprinkled eagle feathers on the whale's head while the community welcomed her, the first in 70 years, to the Macaw Nation. A coalition of indigenous peoples and non-natives throughout the world supported the hunt at several critical stages. When the United States removed the gray whale from the list of endangered wildlife in 1994, the tribal nation expressed interest in resuming customary whale hunts. With the support of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, in 1997, the macaws petitioned the International Whaling Commission for approval of annual subsistence hunts. The IWC granted the tribal nation a yearly quota of five whales, one for each ancestral macaw village near Cape Flattery, the northwesternmost tip of the contiguous United States. After landing the whale at Nia Bay, members of the community stripped blubber and meat from the carcass and hosted a large feast reminiscent of potlatches from earlier centuries. Macaw elder Dale Johnson remembers that getting the whale brought a gathering of people. Tribes from all over came in as the whalers shared the catch. In addition to American Indians from Alaska, the Great Plains, and the West Coast, indigenous peoples from across, the North, from across North America, the Pacific, and Africa were honored guests at the celebratory feast. Billy Frank Jr., an Esqually elder, spoke passionately about the importance of exercising treaty rights. Many non-natives also supported the hunt because whaling is a treaty right that macaws reserved for themselves in the 1855 Treaty of Nia Bay, which the tribal nation signed with the United States. Coming at the close of the 20th century, however, the whalers' actions drew passionate opposition. And these are captured in the following excerpts taken from letters to editors of newspapers here in Puget Sound. Aboriginal hunting? Aboriginals hunted in cedar canoes with muscle-tipped harpoons and seal-skin floats. The macaw's slaughter of the gray with a modern assault weapon is by no means traditional. Okay, one opinion. I wish these guys Macaw would get with the 20th century. The macaws are not acting like their ancestors who lived in harmony with the environment using only what they needed. The macaws with their supermarkets and cars no longer need to kill a being as sentient as our mammoth whales. They get better. 
these people want to rekindle their traditional way of life by killing an animal that has probably twice the mental capacity they have. These idiots need to use what little brains they have to do something productive besides getting drunk and spending federal funds to live on. Here's my favorite. I am anxious to know where I can apply for a license to kill Indians. My forefathers helped settle the West and it was their tradition to kill every red skin they saw. The only good Indian was a dead Indian, they believed. I also want to keep with the faith of my ancestors. It's not too far beneath the surface, is it? Now responses such, of the, such as these drew me to this project. And I was struck by ways that most people, even those in support of the macaws, failed to understand why this was important to the tribal nation today. Static notions of Indian authenticity framed many of the, much of the criticism and a lot of the support. The public at large seemed to believe that the macaws did this because they wanted to live for better or worse in the past. And to me, that just didn't make sense. So I embarked on this project to examine the longer history of the macaw's relationship with the ocean. And what I found became the sea as my country. So in this book, the macaws, I argue that the macaws shaped marine space in and around the Strait of Juan de Fuca rather than terrestrial spaces as the primary locus of their identity. Strategic exploitation of this marine borderland enabled them to participate in global networks of exchange, to resist assimilation, and to retain greater autonomy than many other land-based reservation communities. A number of factors from the late 19th century on, however, undercut the macaw's ability to derive a rich living from the sea. Yet the sea is my country is no narrative of native declension. In recent decades, macaws have fought for and regained substantial, but not all, access to customary marine space and resources. So modern macaw whaling, in the way I detailed in my opening, is a continuation of reclaiming marine space, marking for macaws what I call a traditional future. So in this evening's talk, I want to prioritize macaw voices as I have found them in the archival record and through oral histories. On the issue of modern macaw whaling, non-native voices and rhetoric, like that garbage that I shared with you in those few previous slides, that's received too much attention. So in my research for this book, I found many macaw statements and actions that illustrated how they have made and continue to maintain this marine space as theirs. Highlighting macaw voices provides the best context for understanding why whaling remains important to them today. And it will also give you a sense of how I do history as a native person in the academy. So who are the macaw and where do they live? Now, this audience here should have a pretty good idea of that when I used to give these lectures back in New England, I'd say, get on I-90, drive for five days, get to Seattle, drive for another four to five hours, and then you'll get out there. But most relevantly, what we need to know about the macaws is that they are a Northwest Coast people who live at Cape Flattery, the most Northwestern point of the contiguous United States. And they have been living there for at least the last 2,000 years. Like other Northwest Coast peoples, they rely on the wealth of seafood resources that foster dense, complex societies in this region of North America. And unlike their neighbors, access to whales, halibut, and seals gave them unique resources that allowed them to position themselves as prominent middlemen in trade networks extending from Northern California to Southern Alaska and east to the foothills of the Rockies. Macaws are a marine people. What they call themselves, the Quidditchaat, meaning the people of the Cape, reflects this marine orientation. 
throughout their history, their statements have reflected the importance of the sea. So during the first encounter that macaws had with non-natives in the waters off Cape Flattery, the people of the Cape articulated their authority over a large extent of marine waters. The clear sunny June afternoon made it easy for macaws to spot the sails of a non-native ship approaching one of their seasonal villages. Chief Tatouche had anticipated the vessel's arrival after it had spent a month at Nootka Sound. These strangers had been in neutral Nulth communities, trading for furs with neighboring rival chiefs, Maquinna and Wiccaninish. And the outsiders had recently agreed to an exclusive trading arrangement with Wiccaninish. In preparation for the stranger's arrival, Tatusha's warriors clothed themselves in the skins of Tchuk sea otters, painted their faces with red and black ochre, and armed themselves with bows, barbed arrows, and muscle-shell-tipped harpoons. In order to show his stout, courageous heart, Tatouche painted his face black and added glittering sand. When the vessel entered Macaw waters in 1788, Tatouche led his warriors in numerous large war canoes as they surrounded the intruding ship, the first of its kind to visit his people. Tatouche boarded the vessel, the Felice adventurer, captained by John Mears, a British Royal Navy veteran who had seen action during the Revolutionary War. Mears noted this encounter in the official account of his voyage, writing, the chief of this spot, whose name is Tatouche, did us the favor of a visit, and so surly and forbidding a character we had not yet seen. He informed us that the power of Wiccaninish ended here, and that we were now within the limits of his government, which extended a considerable way to the southward. Mears gave the imposing chief a small present, and the size of it insulted Tatouche, and the Macaw chief departed and did not allow his people to trade with the newcomers. Financed by private British traders based out of India and Canton, Mears had come to the northwest coast a decade after Captain Cook had sailed into Nootka Sound, sparking the maritime fur trade in sea otter pelts. Mears's purpose was to establish a small trading post at Nootka Sound to the north of Macaw waters so that he could secure from the native chiefs sea otter pelts, which he planned to take to Canton to sell to Chinese traders. Now, unbeknownst to Mears, he had sailed into waters that rival chiefs carefully guarded and contested over. He had sailed into a borderlands. And the British captain had exacerbated pre-existing tensions by agreeing to an exclusive trade agreement proposed by Wiccaninish, one of Chief Tatouche's rivals in the marine borderlands. And Tatouche worried that Wiccaninish, who already had a reputation for expanding his authority at the expense of neighboring chiefs, would continue to grow in power if Tatouche and others did not check the rival's ambitions. So when Tatouche confronted Mears, he communicated his control over waters around Cape Flattery and to the south. Not only was this a statement of authority, but it also demonstrated one of the many complicated ways that native peoples in the northwest coast observed property rights over specific marine spaces and resources. Now, when Mears failed to give adequate gifts to Tatouche, which would have begun the process by which the British could have opened trade with the Macaws, the chief threatened the Felice. Several weeks later, when a small contingent of the Felice's crew sailed into the Strait of Juan de Fuca to assess the trade opportunities and to determine whether this was the Northwest Passage, the long salt water route connecting the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans, Macaws and some allies on Vancouver Island expelled them. While the British understood these actions as the stereotypical savage impulse to stymie the civilizing work of exploration and free commerce, 
Macaws and others acted within their own cultural frameworks of power and diplomacy. What was at stake were the regional marine trade routes and influence throughout the Strait of Juan de Fuca. So in this instance in the late 18th century, macaws maintained their authority over marine space, which positioned them to become wealthy and influential traders in the maritime and land-based fur trades that lasted into the mid-19th century. Continued control over marine space and resources kept the macaws strong as British and colonial intrusions increased in the mid-19th century. And this set the context for the next macaw statement about marine space. One January morning in 1855, the macaws at Nia Bay awoke to find the schooner Potter anchored just offshore. It had brought Governor Isaac Stevens and his treaty commission to this corner of Washington territory to negotiate with the macaws. Now Stevens knew that a suite of diseases in the last few years had swept through the Cape Flattery villages, bringing the powerful macaws from 2,500 people to around 500. His hope was that this newly weakened position would enable him to force massive concessions from the people of the Cape on his terms. One morning in 1855, Macaws at Nia Bay awoke to find a vessel anchored in the bay. They recognized the potter and knew its captain, E.M. Fowler. As on its previous visit, the potter brought some Bostons, what they called the Americans, on government business. Earlier, Colonel Michael Simmons, the territorial Indian agent, had stopped at Nia Bay and tried to impress upon the people of the Cape the importance of signing a treaty with the United States. This time, the potter carried Washington's territorial governor, Isaac Stevens, and members of his treaty commission. The commissioners had come to this remote corner of the United States to negotiate a treaty with the residents of Cape Flattery. After warily observing the governor and surveyor map out reservation boundaries, six leaders from Nia Bay and other nearby Macaw villages boarded the potter to learn about the proposed treaty and to state their concerns. The chiefs listened while Stevens explained that the great father had sent him to watch over them. To open the negotiations, Stevens explained his perspective on the proposed treaty. Like the treaties that Stevens had signed with Puget Sound tribal nations, this one would transfer native land to the United States. And in return, the federal government would provide a reservation, school, farms, and a physician, among other items. The chiefs cared little for what Stevens offered. Instead, each one emphasized the importance of retaining their marine tenure. Five of them spoke about the need to reserve their fishing and whaling rights. Kilchut, one of the two chiefs representing Nia Bay, stated, I ought to have the right to fish and take whales and get food when I like. I am afraid that if I cannot take halibut where I want, I will become poor. Governor Stevens acknowledged this position by replying that he wanted them to continue fishing and whaling he only wanted whites to do so, too. Kilchut conceded that he would live as a friend to the whites and they should fish together. Except for the 1853 smallpox epidemic, the past several decades of interactions with King George men, what they called the British, and the Bostons, had gone well because the people of the Cape had profited by selling oil, seal skins, and fish to traders and vessels. But Macaw's statements also articulated a marine space connection broader than fishing and whaling rights. Individuals spoke of specific marine locations that they owned. More important, these Macaw leaders identified the ocean as the homeland of their people. In describing his holdings, 
he took, told the Bostons that he did not want to leave the salt water. Appointed head chief by Governor Stevens, Tsukawadal of Ozette stated it clearest. I want the sea, that is my country. Wanting to impress upon the governor the importance of this statement, Tsukawadal refused to even consider the terms of the treaty until Stevens joined him in a canoe on the salt water. And as the two leaders <laughs> paddled around, the Ozette chief explained that the sea was his country. Now most Americans misunderstand Indian treaties on multiple levels. They assume that all Indian treaties were dictated by the government and that native negotiators were passive victims who could only accept whatever the government gave them. There are some kernels of truth in this assumption. The United States certainly held more power than Indian peoples did during the majority of these negotiations in the 19th century. And treaty negotiations were often plagued by misunderstandings, purposeful mistranslations, and flat out fraud. For many treaties, such as the one that Stevens initially offered the Macaw, government negotiators worked from pre-drafted treaties that certainly privileged non-native priorities over those of native peoples. Yet even within this gross power imbalance, savvy Indian negotiators found ways to secure for themselves and their people specific guarantees that carved out a way to survive amid the expanding settler colonial world. Which leads me to the most inaccurate assumption held by most Americans, that the federal government gave treaty rights to natives. I hear this all the time. And this is where that whiny discourse on special rights held by Indian peoples comes from. Why do Indians get to open casinos and sell fireworks and cigarettes? Why do Indians get special hunting and fishing rights that the rest of us cannot enjoy? Why does taxpayer money subsidize all these special rights and privileges? These treaty opponents argue that what the government gives can easily be taken away. What these critics fail to understand is that Indian negotiators reserved for themselves and their descendants specific treaty rights and annuities in return for large land sessions. If there's one thing that you remember from what I talk about tonight, it's that, that Native peoples reserved these rights they already had and kept them for themselves. In the case of the Treaty of Nia Bay, Macaw leaders like Tsukawatl insisted that Stevens alter his treaty draft to accommodate Macaw priorities, such as the preservation of whaling, sealing, and fishing rights. Notes for the negotiations record that Stevens even promised to support the marine industries of the people of the Cape by furnishing equipment so they could better preserve and sell their products in Anglo markets. But in an example of just one of many fraudulent dealings common to Indian treaties, this promise, this verbal promise, somehow never made it into the final draft that no Macaw at that time could have read. Now despite these early broken promises and many subsequent others, the decades following the treaty were still relatively good for the people of the Cape. They found new markets for their marine products, including whale oil, which they sold by tens of thousands of gallons annually to neighboring Indians and Anglo traders, and fresh and preserved halibut and salmon, which they sold to nascent Anglo communities in Puget Sound and on Vancouver Island. So this economic autonomy secured by customary practices such as whaling, sealing, and fishing, allowed them to resist and reframe much of the assimilation project that Indian agents tried to enforce on the reservation. 
You know, and this is at the time when Indian agents wielded what seemed like complete power. And on other reservation communities, if the native peoples there didn't do what the Indian agent told them to do, he simply starved them out, would refuse to give them their annuity goods, and they would go hungry. For the macaws, that wasn't a problem. They didn't take food necessarily as annuity goods at this time, because they fed themselves through their marine industries. Several agents noted that the macaws' maritime industries probably better civilized the tribe than agricultural pursuits ever would in this damp coastal land where the Olympic Mountains came down to the sea. For the people of the Cape, their most successful maritime industry of the last quarter of the 19th century was hunting fur seals along the coast and in the open ocean. By the 1870s, the skins of fur seals, a sea mammal long hunted by macaws for their flesh, hide, and oil, had become a valuable commodity. Skins from the North Pacific ended up in London, the center of the fur industry. Macaws annually made over $10,000 selling seal skins they had hunted from their canoes 10 to 40 miles offshore during the first several months of the year. Now, $10,000 doesn't sound like a lot to us right now, but it was a lot back in the, 19, in the late 19th century. And their success drew the attention of Anglo schooner owners based out of Victoria, Port Townsend, Seattle, and even as far as San Francisco. So for a third of the catch, these vessels took macaw sealers in their canoes out to sea. The macaws hired these schooners to take them out to sea so they could better participate in, sealing hunt in seal hunting. Now macaws quickly saw the benefit of schooner ownership. By the late 1880s, a number of families owned schooners, even fleets of these things. And in the coastal hunts, they used them as floating bases for canoes of macaw hunters. Beginning in 1887, they sailed them into the Bering Sea where they made even greater profits. For instance, in 1895, macaw sealers brought in over $44,000 during just several months of sealing. And this was an incredible profit, making this small community of Indians wealthier than most of their non-native neighbors. You can imagine how well that went over. But macaws brought their schooners into the Bering Sea at the same time that the US federal government was attempting to assert more control over this very same space. Like it did the people of the Cape, sealing brought the federal government substantial profits, half a million dollars annually, which the leaseholder of the Pribilof Islands paid for its monopoly to hunt fur seals on land in their birthing grounds. So this corporation worried that pelagic hunters, such as the macaws and foreign hunters from Japan, Russia, and British Columbia, took too many seals at sea and threatened the conservation of the species, and most importantly, their profitable industry. So from the 1890s until the 1910s, the US government engaged in diplomatic efforts to shut out foreign sealers. And in the last decade of the 19th century, the government also sought to curb American sealers not employed by the leaseholder of the Pribilofs. They passed legislation in 1897 that barred US citizens from pelagic sealing in the North Pacific at any time of the year. The only exception would be for coastal Indians who could continue to seal from canoes, but only for subsistence purposes and with spears. And this was not supposed to be commercial in any way. So on one hand, this exemption protected the subsistence rights of Indians to hunt seals. However, this exemption applied a stereotype of the archaic native who only hunts for subsistence purposes. It seemed ignorant of macaws 
modern Indians who were engaged commercial actors in the North Pacific extractive economy. So the assumption by these people writing this legislation back in Washington, D.C., was that Indians were only market hunters employed by non-Indians. And if left to their own devices, they would simply hunt to just put enough food on the table. That clearly wasn't the case. So this brings me to my next Macaw statement about the importance of their marine space, specifically the maritime industry of sealing. And this is a shot from a primary source that I found after digging through loads of documents in Washington, D.C. And as I kind of describe this source to you and the language that's in it, uh, just imagine like how happy I was <laughs> to find this. Like, it's like one of these golden threads uh, needles you're always hoping to find in a big stack of documents. And this one is written by Macaws. In December of 1897, the Coplanahos one particular family of macaws, led a petition effort for an exemption to the impending prohibition. The formal typed petition and the language expressed in this document illustrated the way macaws adapted certain non-native strategies and the rhetoric of progress for their own cultural purposes, specifically the protection of the sovereign right to develop resources as they saw fit. The petitioners began by connecting their contemporary se commercial sealing activities to cultural traditions. Seals had always furnished them with clothing and food. Then they invoked the specific 1855 treaty right to take seals forever and to never have this right limited by the government. Objecting to the meager exemption allowing natives to hunt from canoes they worried that permission to hunt seal in open canoe 50 miles from shore, much less up in the Bering Sea, is but permission to go to certain death. For a generation of hunters then used to the safety that schooners offered in deep ocean waters, this anxiety must have appeared all too real. They drew on assimilation rhetoric to demonstrate the progress that they'd made through sealing. They had invested all their capital in schooners and appliances for sealing, a trade that they understood very well. Seeking the attention of fiscally conservative officials, the petitioners pointed out that they supported themselves without government aid through this industry. The petitioners also cast themselves as Christians, arguing that God gave us the seals for our sustenance. And finally, they attempted to appeal to a sense of fairness. We think we ask only what is justice and equity is due us. You call us your wards, and the care of our interest is in your hands. To prohibit us from sealing would take us our livelihood and destroy our capital, all our capital, which is invested in boats and appliances for sealing. The misery and want which would come to us would be such as would come to your people if from them were taken at once lands and tools and stock and factories and mines, and they were left to face ruin and starvation. Pelagic sealing defined them not only as macaw, but also as productive members of a modern American society. In their minds, the macaw right to seal was no different than a miner's right to extract ore, a rancher's right to raise livestock, or a factory owner's right to manufacture goods. Despite the concerted efforts of the Coplanahos and others, the 1897 law that prohibited pelagic sealing by U.S. citizens ended their commercial industry for the people of the Cape. Shortly after the law's passage, revenue cutters steamed into Nia Bay and confiscated the largest schooners, including three owned by James and John G., kind of the patriarchs of the Coplanaho family. The cutters towed a dozen macaw ships to the nearby life-saving service station 
which the federal government had taken from Macaw lands to make this service station, there at the western edge of Nia Bay and beached them there where they remained until storms and waves destroyed them. It didn't even give them the option of like retooling them for halibut fishing or something else. They just took them away. As Macaws still recall, the U.S. prohibition on pelagic sealing was a turning point that undermined their economic security. During the first quarter of the 20th century, the people of the Cape suffered from heavy-handed Indian agents, then superintendents, intent on separating Macaw livelihood from the sea. These officials knew that Macaw reliance on their marine space had allowed them to maintain a degree of autonomy that most American Indians did not have at this time. And in the 1930s, under the Indian Reorganization Act, Macaws formed a tribal government along constitutional lines. Among the new tribal council's priorities, like literally one of the first things their government did was to hire their own lawyers so they could pursue court cases that would restore the marine treaty rights they had lost and protect the little that remained. Macaws were part of a string of court cases that eventually culminated in the 1974 Bolt decision, a victory for Washington State's federally recognized tribal nations because it clarified the treaty language to mean that Indian negotiators had reserved for themselves 50% of the salmon. But as the people of the Cape found success in federal courts, they experienced another defeat in the international arena when Canada and the United States declared exclusive fishery zones. Negotiations between the two nation states placed the Macaw's most lucrative halibut banks, Swiftsure and Forty Mile Bank, in Canadian waters. And the U.S. State Department had ignored this nation's obligations to uphold Macaw treaty rights. The Macaws spoke up in protest. The Macaw Tribal Council tried diploma diplomatic channels after the United States and Canada declared exclusive fishery zones that encompassed tribal marine space. Through their attorneys in 1978, Tribal Council wrote to Ambassador Lloyd Cutler in the State Department reminding him that critical, usual, and accustomed fishing grounds then sat under Canadian maritime jurisdiction. Invoking the 1974 Bolt decision, the Tribal Council stated, we feel it is imperative upon the government to continue to protect our fishing rights for halibut and other species in the Pacific Ocean and any new agreements which may be reached with the government of Canada. Our rights must, of course, be grandfathered in, not only because they are traditional and historic in the normal sense of the word, but also because they have been recognized by treaties with the United States government. But when Ambassador Cutler and others negotiated new agreements with Canada with respect to these overlapping claims in the exclusive fishery zone off the Strait of Juan de Fuca, they ignored Macaw Treaty rights. Instead, in the 1979 protocol, these diplomats secured the access of sports fishers to Swiftsure and other historically Macaw banks in Canadian waters. Currently, these non-natives fish former Macaw banks and land their catch at Nia Bay. As a senior fisheries biologist for the Macaw noted, the people of the Cape are deeply concerned by the fact that the United States seems to care more about sport fishermen than treaty Indians when it comes to efforts to secure access to those areas. Outside diplomatic channels, Macaws protested the loss of access to customary marine space by continuing to fish for halibut in the newly claimed Canadian waters during the late 1970s and early 1980s. These actions often resulted in his people having what Macaw fisher Greg Arnold called breakfast on the queen. When Greg shared that 
nugget with me, kind of scratched my head, and chuckled, said what it meant was that Canadian officials arrested these macaw fishers, confiscated their boats and gear, threw them in jail in Victoria, where they awoke the next morning and received breakfast before being released. So when we try to make sense of macaw whaling efforts today, we need to place it within this larger and longer context of statements about the importance of their marine space, how it still belongs to the people of the Cape. Although I have focused on words spoken or written by macaws, they have also backed up their words with actions. By preventing non-macaws from fishing or sealing in macaw waters in the 19th century, by fishing illegally to exercise their treaty rights in the 20th century, by harpooning a whale more recently. And so what I set out to do in this book is to explain the contours of this larger context. And as I wrote at the end, by placing the 1999 whale hunt within the larger context of a macaw narrative that focuses on their connection to marine space, we can see that the people of the Cape have a history of combining customary practices with modern opportunities and technologies. By deciding what constitutes traditional culture and how they will practice it, macaws are exercising self-determination and expressing their identity in today's world. Macaws continue to confront the ongoing effects of colonialism representing themselves as a modern indigenous community amid national and international pressures. Indigenous traditions and customary practices are not static cultural components frozen in time. They change over time. For macaws, these changes exemplify the resilient, adaptive capacity of Indian groups to respond to colonialism in challenging and often deadly circumstances. The people of the Cape are demonstrating that they live in the present and are moving into the future while retaining what they believe is best about their traditions. Or as one macaw phrased it, we are whalers. We don't want a wonder bread culture. So thank you for your time this evening. I think we've got a little bit of time left over for some questions, which I'd be happy to address. How many whales per year do the macaw tribe typically? Oh, how many whales per year do the macaw tribe typically take? That's a great question. <laughs> and so, looking at various numbers and records in the archival documents, listening to a lot of oral histories from different whaling families, the best that I could really do is to take a look at this number from the 1850s, where George Gibbs. Um, he was one of the secretaries of the Treaty Commission. He'd, done, he'd, he'd gone around to the territory, talked to different Indian agents and settlers, and gathered information on the tribal nations in preparation for the treaties. And he reported that macaws in the mid-1850s were annually selling 30,000 gallons of whale oil, it's like a lot, to non-natives coming through the area and passing ships to traders up in Victoria um, and that they and neighboring tribes, and they kept an equal amount for their own consumption. So that's 60,000 gallons annually. So then the task was, well, how many gallons can you render from a whale? You know, and whales are different sizes and you know different kinds, and macaws hunted like the full spectrum of whales out there. 
whether it be grays and humpbacks, the more common ones, orcas for the young men that wanted to really show their prowess. Yeah, you start thinking about that. Sperm whales, blue whales, when they go out into deeper waters. Uh, and so then I was looking at what uh, one particular observer uh, out there, James Swan at the time, is he was talking to macaw whalers in the 1860s about how much oil they would render uh, from that, from, from a whale or from their catch or on an annual basis. And crunching those numbers, I came up with 26 whales per year for that amount of whale oil. And that's an estimate and a conservative estimate. Um, you know, so that gives you kind of some context for thinking about just the number of whales that they're asking for now uh, in retrospect with what they once caught. Again, thank you so much for coming. I was wondering, at the beginning you presented how people reacted to the 1999 macaw yeah. whale hunt, and I was wondering how people reacted to this book specifically. Like when it was released, did you get some of those similar reactions, or was like what was the public's opinion? Um, surprisingly, the audiences have been really polite. I guess if I really wanted to like make news, I could like I don't know email Sea, sea Shepherd Society every time I give a talk and see if anyone bothers to show up. Um, they'd probably only come if cameras are here, and there's one here today, um, so maybe they would. Um, so far, the reception has been quite good, and for me. The reception I care most deeply about is that of, the, of, of macaws. And so, you know, and I was speaking with students earlier today, you know, about how I do the research and work that I do. I do it in collaboration and conversation with any tribal nation, you know, when I'm doing this kind of work. And so from the very beginning, you know, I went out to meet people. I followed up on relations that I, relationships I already had before even thinking about going to grad school um, and developed questions alongside them, interviewed elders that they wanted to have interviewed, you know, that there was, that there was this ongoing relationship so that what I was presenting and writing and the analysis I was doing um, really kind of, you know, rang true uh, with their concerns and how they know and remember history. And so for me, it's, um, it's, it's just how you do history accurately and ethically by being accountable to the people that you're writing about. Um, and that's where my accountability firmly sits. Um, every now and then in academic circles, somebody will kind of push back on certain things. Um, I think I had one Dutch guy that was really cranky at me at an environmental history thing, but that's, you know, he, he's really been the only one so far. Do you have an estimate of how many whales, I don't know how you count them, but that there are in those waters? And secondly, yeah. how many macaw there are in the tribe and do they live on a reservation or? Yeah, yeah, so I don't have any estimates on whales in the waters immediately around Kit Flattery. Um, I do know though in the work that I've done as an expert witness for the tribe and listening to and learning from um, marine mammal biologists that gray whales in the North Pacific are like at carrying capacity. There are over 30,000, um, you know, as far as the population goes, might be 40,000, kind of depends on who's counting and how they're doing the counting and things like that. Um, so the, you know, idea that macaws at most are gonna be taking five whales a year doesn't seem like that's too much of a big pressure that's being put on the particular gray whale population that they're hunting. And the other thing too is that, you know, the IWC issues subsistence or cultural quotas to indigenous peoples to hunt sea mammals. The Chukchi of Siberia have an annual quota of 200. And, you know, as macaws were working with the federal government and starting to get their quota, back in the 90s uh, with the IWC, the Chukchi said, you know, take five out of our 200. So it's not like additional stress on the population so we can kind of undercut that argument 
that some people uh, were busy raising at the time. Um, you know, and in return, they got like, I don't, I don't remember clearly how many like bowheads that they could then hunt in the Arctic. So, you know, there's always kinds of, you know, international agreements and trading that happens. But the point is that, is that the, at least gray whales are at carrying capacity in the North Pacific. Humpbacks have also recovered remarkably in these waters too. And so I can't give you any further estimates beyond that. As far as the number of macaws, um, boy, I should have looked at my latest census records, but uh, I know that there, it's gotta be over 2,000 at this point. It might be up to 2,500, and I think 1,500 live out at Nia Bay. Don't quote me on those numbers. Those are Googleable things on a census, um, but, uh, Okay, so not too far off, um, you know, but those are, um, you know, so, so you, we've seen a remarkable population recovery among many native nations who still face some pretty severe challenges, um, but that's the, that's the numbers. Is there another question? Okay. <clears throat> Um, when whales weren't in sparse numbers during the times, what was the most popular whale that, whale that was um, hunted by the macaw? Because you mentioned gray and you also mentioned humpback. Yeah. So. I've, this is where you guys need your retired uh, professor who's done a lot of like faunal remain analysis at Ozette. Um, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, I've heard that humpbacks might have been their most favored uh, catch. Um, but hump, so I, I think it would go humpbacks and then grays, and then kind of opportunistically whatever other whales um, they 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 could at the right time. Um, but yeah, definitely definitely humpbacks and grays. Probably in that order. Um, I guess I have a, I have a couple quick questions. Oh, yeah. One at the. Um, I, I might have misheard you at the beginning. I thought you, you said about 2,000 years as kind of the duration of at macaw. least. That seems almost short to me, or shorter than I would expect. Right. Um, why is yeah, so people were whaling out of Ozette at least 2,700 years ago. Um, and so there's, you know, and this is based on combinations of archaeological records and also different types of uh, oral histories that macaw families tell themselves. And one of the things I learned while doing this project is that you know, in native nations and in indigenous communities, you know, histories are, especially out here on the Northwest Coast, are owned by families. And each family has its own collection of histories. So as I was beginning to ask questions like, you know, how long have macaws, you know, how long have your people been here? Um, you know, did you come from Vancouver Island? Have you always been here? I got all the above answers. Um, and that made me start to think about and realize kind of this idea of when do a people become a people? So when do people become the macaw in this case? And, you know, you had five different ancestral villages out there and for many, many generations, people thought of themselves as belonging to that village, Suez. That that was their first affiliation, and then Macaw was kind of second, and it's over time that then, you know, they kind of more confederated and became the Macaw, and you see similar patterns happening uh, up along uh, the west coast of Vancouver Island. And Macaws, of course, you know, you've got many who argue, we've been here forever. This is where we're from, we didn't come from anywhere else. You know, and so it's like, you know, when they became a people, that's roughly when I'm dating uh, that, that range. But what's interesting when we start to think about even just, you know, the simple, well, it's not very simple, but the question of when, when did North America become a peopled place, you know, the more that we find out with archaeology and start uh, kind of teasing out other ways that people got here um, or came to be in North America, it's like the further back those dates keep getting pushed literally every year. And so kind of this, you know, land bridge theory is, I mean, we need to kind of put that to rest. Of course, I'm a little biased as a native person myself and as a person who specializes in indigenous marine space, I'm very intrigued by 
what's the likelihood that it, you know, people were coming over along the coast long before there was kind of that land bridge that could be crossed that way. You've got now DNA evidence you know, for Polynesian migration down in South America, along with, of course, that they've got the sweet potato. You know, it's like you know, they've got all these different pieces that are starting to fall into place as we peel back the layers, and it just keeps pushing that date further and further back. So the idea of kind of calling North and South America the new world, you know, we, we need to put that to rest too. Um, and I guess what, if I have one other question was, you mentioned Jane Swan in an earlier yeah. answer. I was curious kind of what people make of his writings, you know, today in, in the Makat, there is kind of a singular perspective on that. No, there's no singular perspective. Um, I think it was my first visit out there when uh, Micah was taking me around and introducing me to some of the tribal council members. And they were, oh, you know, wh wh where are you getting your information? You know, what, what archives are you looking at? And what documents? I said, oh, I'm going through the James Swan Diaries up at UW Special Collections. And I think myself and Ivan Doig and maybe a couple other people are the only ones who have read all 14,400 plus daily entries of that. Um, and they were like, oh, yeah, Swan. Man, we would tell him all kinds of crazy lies and see how far we could get away with things. <laughs> you know, and I was like, uh, you know, and so then, you know, and, and, but this works with any archival document that you're looking at. You really need to read these things with a grain of salt. You need to triangulate multiple sources to really kind of get at what actually was happening. Um, and so, you know, there are some families out there that, uh, recall Swan very fondly, like have stories that they talk about about him, and others who are just like, yeah, white dude, first teacher. Um, yeah, so it, it really, you, you get a full kind of spectrum of that. Um, if you want a real provocative introduction to him, do read Ivan Doig's Winter Brothers. Uh, it's, it's, it's good, Ivan Doig's a great writer, um, and really kind of thought hard about Swan. Um, yeah, interesting guy. Uh, when it comes to stories such as the recognition of indige or indigenous fishing rights, I often see that a lot's been done, but there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, do you see any work being done to restore uh, power in terms of like fisheries management, conservation, and restoration efforts, uh, or are the, do you have any ideas of next steps? Yeah, that's, that's a great question and a very timely one. You know, this is the 50th anniversary of the Bolt decision, um, which, you know, is getting a fair amount of play in the press and number of events and tribal nations kind of grappling with how to commemorate that. And I think one of the biggest outcomes of the Bolt decision is not necessarily the 50%, you know, number that everybody points to, but is the co-management that emerged from that. That, you know, that really kind of brought the state finally, and boy, it resist, the state resisted for years after Bolt, um, finally brought the state to realize that they had to work with tribal nations. They had to work with tribal governments. By this time, the Northwest Indian Fish Commission was, was running. Uh, you have the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, also Crit Fick um, down along the Columbia River. So you have these intertribal governmental organizations that are pushing for treaty fishing rights um, and, and better management practices of the fisheries. You've got the North of Falcon process where they start to tease out like what runs are looking like and who's gonna get how much fish. You have a whole process around halibut, um, which is a whole different topic and fascinating also. And I think what's really interesting is since really the late 70s, certainly through the 1980s, you get a lot of native officials who are now part of this process. And that has made a big difference in how fishery science is done, because you have native peoples doing this and holding fisheries biologists accountable to them. And that's made a profound change in understanding the fishery and you know, kind of the rules and how it works. Um, and of course, Native nations are continuing 
to fight for, um, you know, for, for, for salmon, for fish. Think of the Colvert case, um, you know, that again, the state dragged its feet, had to be brought to court through expensive litigation that they knew they were probably gonna lose anyhow to fix those, to, to fix at least the state-owned culverts to begin to open up more salmon habitat and watersheds. You know, because of the actions of native activists and officials, that happened. Um, better logging practices were forced upon logging companies and national forests at management of these things. But there's still a ridiculous way to go. And what's really gut-wrenching is when I hear native fishers today say that the fish they're catching, the amount of fish they're catching now, even when they're allowed, you know, when, when they're able to catch 50%, is less than what they were catching before Bolt. Because the collapse of the fisheries is so dire, so severe. And, you know, there's a whole host of reasons as to why that's the case. And until we really realize, we as in Washingtonians realize that the treaties aren't just for native peoples, it's for all of us. Until we realize that the treaties bind us all into honoring those treaty rights, we're gonna have a hard time taking the steps that need to be taken over the next 50 years to really save our salmon and that's gonna be making some real hard decisions about development, kinds of tires that go on our cars. I mean, how do we, how do we even fix that? I mean, it's, there's, there's so many issues and it's gonna take a concerted effort to really, really turn things around. But taking down of the Elwha dams, huge step in the right direction. Snake River's next. Actually, Klamath is next, but um, you know, it's, th th there are steps that we can take that will really help substantively, but there's, it's gonna be hard. <laughs> yeah, doom and gloom. <laughs>